After leaving Genesis, Peter Gabriel wasted no time in embarking on a solo career. Three self-titled albums would be released between 1977 and 1980. No longer feeling constrained by the limitations within a band situation, Peter brilliantly illustrated why he had to fly on his own. Early reviews of his self-titled trilogy used words like cerebral, vibrant, experimental, and atmospheric. At that point in his career, he was referred to as a visionary. Well, sometimes I'm ahead of the game, and I think that's partly, you know, from my dad, because he, in 1970, was electrical engineer, inventor, and with an Italian design, this cable TV system, which was this fiber optic base, but they were talking about entertainment on demand, um, uh, electronic democracy, sort of home shopping, all this stuff. But because it was the be right at the beginning of the 70s, it was all based around the rotary dial of the telephone, just to give you an idea how old it was. And uh, so I watched him, you know, campaign for, for things that weren't there yet um, and have a hard time. But I think that's where my interest was sort of for what's coming developed. Peter's third solo disc in 1980 would be considered his artistic breakthrough, establishing him as one of rock's most ambitious and innovative artists. When people call you a visionary, does it make you squirm? No, it's all right. It's a bit, you know, it's like when people call rock artists genius or whatever, and, and you know, and you think that that's a sort of pretty valuable currency. So I'm not sure I'd apply it. I, I think I, I connect to some things before they normally or commonly adopted. He would also become one of music's most political artists. Biko, a song about murdered anti-apartheid activist Stephen Biko, became one of the biggest protest anthems of the 80s. Say it! Say your name! Biko's it's definitely a political statement, more in a vein which which I've been exploring to some extent in the past, and things which have social references. Uh, I've done on quite a few songs, although it's not always been obvious or people haven't picked up on it. I think a lot of people over the value of the effect of music, both in the 60s, the sort of hippie period, when there was all this grand flower power idea of instant revolution. There are grand ideas about social reform as a result of pop music, which I think are greatly exaggerated. But I think what you can do is perhaps trigger ideas and uh, tap people's thinking into a given direction. And, and that's useful. Biko incorporated electronic and world beat elements years before those widespread musical movements would be commonplace. Looking back on it, was there one event that sort of got you inspired by world music? Uh, the first thing I remember actually was um, I had a problem with my radio and I was flicking around shortwave looking for something to listen to. I came across some African music, but there were some harmonies and rhythms there that interested me a lot. and. Uh, it was also around the time that drum machines first were invented. Mm. The first, very first one was a kit manufactured by a company called Paya. And so you had the ca capacity to start looking at other rhythms and see what you wanted to program rather than just work with what was available. So I think those were the first sort of moments when I was conscious uh, of looking outside. What is it about different sounds that really turn yeah, you on? Well, I, I, I mean, initially I think it was grooves and voices and then a whole lot else besides. Um, and uh, it just felt fresher than a lot of the stuff I heard coming out of the radio. 
So that was very attractive to me. And uh, and I think like many people, like when you're meeting a whole lot of people from places that don't speak your language, that have very different culture, there's a certain anxiety when you first try and get together. But like animals sniffing around, we eventually find a way to uh, connect and then you start making noises and suddenly, you know, you're a couple of human beings just trying to express yourselves. And, and, uh, and it's a fantastic thing when, when you break that ice and when you find a way to connect. And there isn't any divisions between people from different races or skin colors with just, just musicians. Peter's interest in world music allowed him to establish WOMAD in the early 80s. The traveling festival of world of music, arts, and dance was designed to bring various world music and customs to a Western audience. I remember a train journey coming back from London one night, and I was very excited by some of the things that I just heard, and thinking, how on earth can we get this music to a larger audience? And began trying to think of uh, some sort of event where one might pull in rock and roll musicians that had an interest in uh, world music and use that to bring in an audience uh, and then expose them to music from many cultures. One of the things that depresses me is that a lot of people tend towards cynicism before enthusiasm. And I think particularly in this area we need a lot of enthusiasm because you know most of the people that I know that have been introduced to, uh, to world music by chance or by friends, whatever it is, uh, suddenly find things that they really didn't know about, didn't expect to like, and become really enthusiastic. And we all believe that it's going to have an sort of increasing role in the future, that uh, the sort of shattered blinkers of, of rock are going to be forced open if, if they don't open voluntarily anyway. And for me, the most interesting areas of music are, are those which incorporate some high-tech and some non-European influence. We, in 1980, started this thing called WOMAD, which was a world of music, arts, and dance. And because we couldn't find music that, that we were getting excited about from all over the world, there were maybe two record stores in London, and it was harder still to find live shows. We started the festival, and that got us into uh, Real World Records later on. The Real World Record label was launched in 1989, a joint venture between Peter, his WOMAD organization, and Virgin Records. The goal was to make world music available to consumers everywhere. Today, Real World has issued records from almost 100 artists from 48 countries. And it wasn't about education, it was just about enthusiasm, really. I mean, there was a sort of evangelical sense in some areas just to try and open it up to people and say that this doesn't have to be sort of folk music or cultural music. Uh, uh, this is something that is very real today and not just to be kept in a museum. We had a lot of artists coming into these festivals that couldn't get record deals anywhere. They were making great music, so it was crazy not to do something. So really, that's how the record company began. Regardless which country you're born on this planet, you should have an equal opportunity to get to an audience and get your music seen and heard. Part of what I love about the experience of being with all these musicians from many countries is that you all the time learn more about yourself, learn more about how to be with someone else, and how to be with the people of the world. I think we wanted to be facilitators, and uh, the artists, in many ways, lead what the label does. The natural evolution of Real World Records would be to provide musicians the opportunity to record in a unique environment. Real World Studios was built in 1987 near Bath, England. Peter devised what he described as the ultimate recording studio and video complex. High-tech and handmade was the concept. Real World Studios has been called the most extraordinary recording facility in the world. Clients have included Kylie Minogue, Placebo, James, Lorena McKinnett, and dozens of others. We tried wherever possible to have space and light and the theory being that uh, for our sessions, but also for these musicians who are not so familiar with studios, that they should feel right inside the process and not just separated. Traditionally, you've had the studio here and the control room here, and there's a wall of glass in between, and you get these sort of 
six cold faces uh, looking out at you, and you're sort of in there like an animal in a cage. And the way we try and have it is that if, if it's energetic music, anybody that's in the control room with the artist, you know, in the same space, has got to be dancing or playing percussion or somehow supporting it. Someone, regardless of where they're born, of what color their skin is, of what language they speak, uh, they should, if they have a talent and something to say, have a chance to get hurt. And currently, media is very racist. And, um, you know, you don't get that range of um, cultural mix. Still to come on the story of Peter Gabriel. You know, I always think that when you get on the music biz conveyor belt and you're doing album tour, album tour, album tour, mm. it's like a dog eating its own tail. And, you know, eventually uh, the diet gets a little boring and you need to do something else. Gabriel's solo career gained momentum with his fourth studio endeavor, 1982 Security. The album earned glowing reviews and went gold on the strength of the album's first single, Shock the Monkey. As Peter distanced himself from his old band Genesis, the media had tried to create a rivalry between Peter and his ex-bandmate, Genesis replacement vocalist Phil Collins. Phil had also started to see success as a solo artist in the early 80s. With the split between the band, there was a certain amount of animosity. No, because really, I guess I'd been in there from the word go and we were school friends and I guess there was a better level of understanding, less competitive. I don't see them a lot, but we get on fine whenever, whenever we do. So, you know, I've worked with Phil a little bit since then and uh, you've seen Tony uh, and Mike a little bit too. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's no, no bad feeling. As much as people tried to create a feud between the two Genesis vocalists, Peter and Phil would deny a feud existed. In fact, Phil even guested on Peter's 1977 solo debut, playing drums on some tracks, and Peter returned the favor, contributing some vocals to Phil's Hello, I Must Be Going in 1982. Other people were trying to create this rivalry. Yeah, no, you, you always get that stuff winding up because it's a better story. I watched him sometimes, we'd be in dressing rooms, and, um, you know, I'd be bashing away at the piano and he'd be thumping away and we'd both, you know, be forging some, own, uh, some of our own songs. And, uh, um, and I was thinking at the time, well, we'd, we'd get a... I'm sure there'd be a day when we'd both have a, an outlet for this stuff. Um, and he's a very natural musician. You know, I've got an enormous respect for his talent as a musician. So I'm thinking to guest on his 82 record was almost a way to prove that, you know, listen, stop it, there is no rivalry going on. Yeah, and he was always very generous with his uh, sort of musical time because he, he, you know, he loves to drum and he would come and sit in and offer to, you know, do sessions or live stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's not really been a, a problem there. Peter's fifth studio album, 1986's So, would become his commercial breakthrough, featuring the hit single, Sledgehammer. Some have called the groundbreaking Sledgehammer video the best music video of all time. It would become Peter's first number one single. The video involved over 100 hours of filming and would result in being MTV's most played video of all time. The video of Sledgehammer, the sort of frivolous nature of it maybe uh, tends to offset people's image of Peter Gabriel as a very serious man. Oh, I'm very pleased about it. I mean, I've always appreciated uh, humor. And, uh, and seen you know some humor in things that I do, but uh, I think this is the first time that it's come come through visually properly. So 
uh, that pleases me. So would feature three top ten singles and would garner Peter his first Grammy Award. For every job, so many men, so many men, no one needs. Don't give up. The follow-up to So would take six years and would begin the pattern of Peter's long spans between releases. If you look at other forms, whether it's someone writing a book, someone may take seven years to write a book, uh, and someone else seven days, uh, and that's acceptable, that time difference. But in our music, which is so business-based, uh, people start you know, getting upset if you take more than nine months to make a record. And I always think that when you get on the music biz conveyor belt and you're doing album tour, album tour, album tour, it's like a dog eating its own tail, and, you know, eventually, uh, the diet gets a little boring and you need to do something else um, for your own sanity, let alone uh, what you're putting in. And you know, as they say in the computer speak, garbage in, garbage out. Um, so I try to do a few other things that interest me as, as well as that. Don't say nothing. Keep your hands on the wheel. Don't turn around. This is for real. 1992's follow-up to So would prove to be worth the wait. Us would be considerably darker as Peter would be going through a divorce during the recording. The album would reach platinum sales and mark his third decade as a hit maker. You had success in the 70s, 80s, 90s. A lot of your contemporaries have been tied to a certain decade. You've always avoided that. And I'm wondering how. I'm wondering too, yes. Um, I think it's just by staying open, interested, and curious, you know, and, and I'm very lucky in lots of ways, because with the um, one, I've got the tools of production uh, in the sense that I have a studio, I have a freedom to, you know, open canvas. The Tulsa Womad real world thing brings in all sorts of musicians. It's like a train station with the world traveling through. and. Mm. And so the stuff there to inspire me, I think that's a little different than when musicians tend to hide themselves away. And, uh, and it's also, you know, it requires a certain amount of courage when you start trying to work with people from different cultures or different places other than your own. That's, I think, kept me um, on my toes. Still to come on the story of Peter Gabriel. In cultures where death is part of life, uh, they seem somehow more vital, more alive than, mm. than a lot of our culture, which is just pretending that it doesn't get old and just attached to youth. So uh, I, I feel more comfortable with that. And the darkness still has work to do. Knotted cords untying the heated and the holy, oh, they're sitting there on high, so secure with everything they're buying in the blood of Peter. Peter Gabriel has long concerned himself with improving the world through various endeavors and a number of charitable organizations and causes. I'd rather live in a society where people are making some attempts to improve the world than one that couldn't give a damn. I, I just think people have a responsibility to, to do whatever they can and make their voice heard because at a certain point, uh, if the number of people gets large enough, then attention will will be paid. Peter would co-headline the first benefit tour for Amnesty International in 1986, along with Sting, U2, Brian Adams, Bob Geldof, and others. The Conspiracy of Hope tour would commemorate the 25th anniversary of Amnesty. Amnesty International was established to bring awareness to the plight of political prisoners being held captive and tortured around the world and other human rights violations. With all the atrocities of Hitler, um, there are more people in jail and more people being tortured and executed now than there were in uh, the whole of the Second World War. Now, that is an atrocity in itself, uh, and very few of us are prepared to do anything. And yet the planet is shrinking, 
There is no doubt that we can affect things in other countries, yet most of us are choosing not to do that. It was at an earlier press conference when Bono pointed out that uh, the people uh, that have suffered torture in the last six months are, is a greater in number than those involved in the outrages against the Jewish people in Germany in the war. I have some uh, German friends my age who were asking their parents how they could just sit back knowing that these things were going on. And I hope when my kids ask me that question in connection with the outrages and torture that's going on in the world now, that I'll be able to say that I did something on this tour and I'm very proud to be here. At the end of the concert, sometimes you, you'd meet people who'd been in jail for six years or been tortured for many months on end, and they'd be there shaking your hand with tears in their eyes, and suddenly there was a real sense of why we were doing it. Just in numbers, too, the, the uh, amnesty, the, the phones were being flooded, and they were hoping to get 25,000 people writing letters and postcards uh, to, to stop the torture and stop the uh, imprisonment. And, and I think they have, you know, 60,000 plus. So in that way, it was definitely a success. And, and I think just in North America generally, a lot of people had no idea what amnesty was, what it did. Um, and, and I think they are really capable of doing for human rights what Live Aid did for hunger. They were aiming for 25,000 new letter writers because one of the most effective weapons that they have is just very simple. It's just people sending postcards to embarrass the governments and the jailers who were uh, committing the torture and imprisoning people. Um, and I think they've got, you know, 60,000, so, uh, so that's way more. And I think on, on the money side, too, they're doing well. So I think in, in all the targets, it's succeeding. Peter would lend his time and attention to Amnesty once again. Two years later, he would co-headline the Human Rights Now Amnesty Benefit Concerts. <laughs> same year, Peter also co-headlined the Nelson Mandela 70th birthday tribute concert at Wembley Stadium. The South African-born Nelson Mandela had actively pursued resistance in the ruling National Party's apartheid policies. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in 1964, accused of plotting to overthrow the government. He became a potent symbol of resistance as the anti-apartheid movement grew. He consistently refused to compromise his political position to obtain freedom. We would like to welcome someone on stage that's been a great influence on our music and also on our politics. First time I ever went to a rock concert, this guy was on stage. He was singing then. He was a personal hero of mine, and he still is. And please welcome Mr. Peter Gabriel. South Africa is the only country in the world which has racism enshrined in its constitution. It was a message from all of us, from all of you, from the sons and daughters of the South African government, but it's time for a change. And I hope uh, also that, that the kids of of the South African government, that the young white South Africans will look and see what these musicians, you know, who are popular there, are saying about their country, and that that will help speed the process of change. I, I don't endorse violence, but uh, what has gone on for so many years now is outrageous and should come to a stop. Nelson Mandela would be released from jail two years later. He would plunge himself wholeheartedly into his life's work, striving to attain goals he had set out almost 40 years previous. The same year, at the same venue, another tribute concert for Nelson Mandela was held, this time to commemorate his freedom. Peter Gabriel would headline the 1990 Nelson Mandela tribute concert.
In addition to performing benefit concerts, Peter has had a long track record of donating songs to benefit albums. He has contributed material to several collections for Amnesty International, two Greenpeace compilation records, the Princess Diana charity album, and Refuge, a Kosovo benefit disc. In 1993, Peter contributed to the Peace Together compilation record to benefit young people caught in Northern Ireland's political confrontations. I think what I believe in is the power of people, that if there's enough people who shout loudly about something they really care about, that politicians have to take notice because their electoral future is dependent on us. Clearly, there was this sense that you acted in one country and it had an effect in another. You don't have to be afraid. Still to come, Peter on aging, death, and his brand new disc up. I don't think. I'm consciously, you know, losing a lot of sleep thinking about dying, but uh, but it is it's on the table. One man at the window, one girl at the bar. I thought it was funny, your stock answer, for when someone asks you, when is the album coming out? What do you say? September. You don't tell them the year, no. though. <laughs> uh, well, that's what kept them quiet for a while. About five years, I think. <laughs> seen you on the TV. I've seen you on that show. You make the people crazy. And then you let them go. Peter Gabriel's first pop record in 10 years is 2002's Up. As we care. And the hostile folk we keep apart To the red light says on it Wow, it's been 10 years since his last record. And I think that's a popular misconception. Well, you've been busy for 10 years. Yeah, I've been busy. I think people just think you sit around on your own. Uh, so I, I do keep myself pretty occupied, and this has taken a long time. But I didn't have a producer on this, so there was no one really cracking a whip. And whenever I get bored with an idea, I'd move on to something else. And we ended up with 130 things that I was working on, so that was a, a little silly, but um, but I sort of started properly in around 95, 96, and then, um, yeah, so, so I think with any album I know with its own archaeology department, you know. <laughs> Some are referring to this as a, as a comeback record. Right. Every record I make is a comeback <laughs> record. I've never been quick. <laughs> When everyone knows there's going to be a brand new Peter Gabriel record, they're going to think, is it going to be like security? Is it going to be like us? Is it going to be like so? It doesn't sound like anything like you've ever done. Good. Well, uh, I, it's very hard for me to judge. You know, to me, it's a sort of continuation of songwriting and less sort of world focus. But um, I'm happy if you think it sounds fresh. Do you think of that going in? I'm going to do something that I've never done before. Yeah, I'd like for it to sound different in some ways, but the selection was somewhat random process you know I think people think you have a clear goal in mind but the way I work is to sort of throw a lot of mud on the wall and you sort of spiral inwards till you find where you're going most other people know where they're going and just go straight for it are you happy with the end result most of the time oh uh, yeah and um, it's it's a more interesting route Not the way it 
has to be What I do not know There's a line in Signal to Noise, um, still something in my heart to find a way to make a start. This is a line that to me is a really good indication of something you talked about years ago, and that is you like to give the listener an escape hatch of positivity. Yeah, there's some pretty bleak subject matter and about five songs dealing with death, but I think that, that in a way they're quite positive. And, you know, our culture is youth dominated and we run away from death. Uh, and when you run away from something, you often find yourself going right back into it. Uh, and in other cultures where they accept death or they have uh, initiations, which sort of include some death-like rituals, uh, there's a presence of death in life and, and somehow they're more alive. Um, so I see that as a positive thing and I, and I think Signal to Noise is in a sort of very English way of writing, um, saying the same sort of thing as get up, stand up. The whole dead person's market is something that people haven't really addressed so far. So I was just uh, writing about things that interested me, and there were four or five that ended up about death in one way or another. But there's also some about the beginning of life, too. So I think it was sort of being more connected to the uh, beginning and end that. Uh, um, got me fired up. All the walls closing on me. Precious building, wave on wave. Till the water breaks on outside. I go on. Your own mortality. I'm not gonna die. <laughs> so <laughs> I sorted that one out because I didn't like the idea of it, you know. <laughs> when people are bringing it up, do you start thinking about it? Um, occasionally, you know, it, it's, I mean, something that I'm aware of, now, and, I, and I do say seriously now that at 52, I know people who have died now, whereas at 20, you know, there are very few, grandparents maybe, but um, now it's sort of more on the table. I lost a brother-in-law, friend with a heart attack, someone else struggling with cancer, and so it's um, it's a real thing now. Um, and I think looking around that in cultures where death is part of life, uh, they seem somehow more vital, more alive than, mm. than a lot of our culture, which is just pretending that it doesn't get old and just attached to youth. So uh, I, f I feel more comfortable with that and with myself. So um, I don't think I'm consciously, you know, losing a lot of sleep thinking about dying, but uh, but it is it's on the table. Hi, I'm Chris McDonald. We're here on the set of the Peter Gabriel new big hit. He's got called the Barry Williams Show, and I play Barry Williams. I'm gonna show you on the studio. Come on. Barry Williams Show. Yeah, and Barry well, uh, was a mentor to a lot of people, not unlike Jerry Springer. Uh, Barry was Jerry's biggest, you know, hero. And uh, so I predate all that stuff. And basically, what I do is I talk about the dysfunctional excess. Is all it took for my success. Lyric of the song. I'm backstage. This is where all the freaks are. Okay, dancers. Say hello to my dancers. Hey. Oh, Hollywood. Yeah, okay. This is her twin sister. Hi, Hi, John. We're in a little backstage. Freak. Freak. Dad's upset. His daughter's selling sex. <laughs> the dominatrix and her submissive. She was once a man. It's partly a little uh, fable about reality TV and uh, you know where that where that's going and, and what it does to people. Um, and I know for myself, you know, you want to watch it sometimes, but it's a little like junk food. Uh, you have an appetite for it, but it doesn't make you feel very good at the end of it. 
I called up Sean Penn because uh, I think he's a very good director. And for the song, I wanted something that was quite dark, that had some guts to it. And I thought he would do that quite well. Uh, and, and some humor. Off the bat, I was really flattered to get the call. And then, because uh, I, I, I think he's a great artist and, and, and somebody that's been an inspiration to me in, 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 a, in a million ways for a long time. Reputation of a surgeon, cause they cannot feel the cut. It looks so very simple, but it really is an art. Well, when I was looking for a name, I was trying to think of someone uh, who would be suitable for TV, but I had no idea when I came up with the name Barry Williams that there already was someone that uh, Americans would be familiar with, with the name Barry Williams. When Peter wrote the song, he was searching for a name that would work well musically. And he had tried apparently several different names, and he happened to land on Barry Williams. And although he might have been aware of the Brady Bunch and was, I don't think he made the connection between Brady Bunch, Greg Brady, Barry Williams. So basically, he was just using a name that worked like a good lyric. I really was uh, ignorant of, uh, of the real people attached, but probably, you know, any name that sounded as if it lived in TV land would probably have some real faces attached. Um, just, I think this name had more well-known faces than I realized. Playback. Numbers. Got it. Got it. And Dolly. The call studio, the hospital, making money from the sick. We let people be themselves. There is no other trick. I know you're shy of certain words that people used to describe you. Sexy. <laughs> Not shy of that one. Genius has come up, innovator. Yeah. People do need words to describe you. Brad Pitt look alike. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't know. You know, whatever comes up, really is, I, mean, I think people in the music business use the word genius a little too easily. I mean, I think, you know, I do my thing and I mix it up uh, in, a, in a way that's different. But uh, I don't think I'm Einstein. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for Mr. Peter Gabriel. Bye.